Fantasy kills imagination. Pornography is death to art. In dim light, I close my eyes and remove my clothes, letting my own fingers explore my sensitive areas. Doesn't some pornography just depict men as men and women as women doing what they like to do? Lying quietly, I indulge in the wildest of fantasies, letting my mind float freely on someone who excites me. No social conformity is imposed inside my mind. Does pornography treat women as mere objects? Does pornography treat men as mere objects? I most want the man who is stimulated by the vision of me, unashamedly naked. Isn't pornography just literature designed to be read with one hand? Our guest is Ray Langton, author of Sexual Solipsism. Pornography. Coming up on Philosophy Talk, after the news. Welcome to Philosophy Talk, the program that questions everything. Except your intelligence. I'm John Perry. And I'm Ken Taylor. We're coming to you from the studios of KALW San Francisco. Continuing conversations that began at Philosopher's Corner on the Stanford campus. Our topic today, pornography. Well, Ken, the first thing we should probably do with a topic like pornography is define our terms. We should define pornography. Well, John, but remember the late Supreme Court Justice Potter Stewart, he was famous for having said that he couldn't define pornography, but that he knew it when he saw it. I'm not sure we can do any better here. Well, he's famous for saying that, but it never made much sense to me, because why can't he just tell us what it is he sees when he sees pornography? And it seems to me you could. You'd say pornography is the graphic depiction or descriptions of intimate sexual acts with an intense focus on sexual organs for the express purpose of causing sexual arousal in the viewer, listener, or, in some cases, reader. Uh, that seems too broad, John. That, that definition would make things that are romantic, er artistic, and erotic count as something base and pornographic. Well, some of them, perhaps. Not a lot of them. But uh, it seems to me you're making a pretty common but mistaken assumption that pornography should, by definition, be a bad thing. Well, pornography is a bad thing, John. It debases and objectifies women. It promotes the sexual exploitation of children. It glorifies sexual violence. No doubt some pornography is bad, and just in the ways you say. But how can you claim that pornography is bad by definition? Uh, are you suggesting that we should try to define pornography in value-neutral terms, not in value-laden terms? Exactly right. I, I don't think we should try to settle the moral issues about pornography by loading up what should be a descriptive definition with value-laden terms. We have to look at how pornography actually works at its social, psychological, and economic effects in the real world. You know, I really would like to trump your claim there with the authority of a good dictionary. But, you know, if you look to the dictionary, what you find is disagreement about this thing. The, the Merriam-Webster online dictionary defines pornography as the depiction of erotic behavior, as in pictures or writing, intended to cause sexual excitement. That's a value-neutral definition. But at dictionary.com, you find a more value-laden definition, obscene writings drawings, photographs, or the like, especially those having little or no artistic merit. Well, between those two definitions, I prefer the Merriam-Webster one because it is more value neutral. But I, I actually like mine better because theirs is pretty broad. I mean, a lot of depictions of erotic behavior seem to be not to be pornographic. But however we want to define pornography, we'd still have the same problem. The real question is, which depictions of sex organs and sex acts are morally problematic and which are not? If you want to build being morally problematic into the definition of pornography, you'll need another term to describe the things that are just graphically explicit. What distinguishes the problematic ones from the ones that aren't? Well, I'll tell you what distinguishes the problematic ones. They're the ones that debase and objectify women, that exploit children, that promote sexual violence, all the things I was saying before. Let's set aside child pornography. Uh, I don't think that has any defenders, at least not in the, not in the philosophical literature. But are you are you suggesting that certain representations of sexual acts are intrinsically morally problematic? That that is what I'm suggesting. I mean, there's just something plain distasteful about pictures of naked women in bondage. I mean, don't you agree? Well, tastes vary. Some people like that sort of thing. Obviously, some people like to see pictures of naked men in bondage. Many of us don't really get turned on by that. But we're not discussing matters of taste. We want to discuss matters of morality. Well, I think we are discussing matters of morality. There's something intrinsically morally wrong with representations of women in sexual bondage. Anybody, 
ought to find such representations distasteful. Now, you know, I might not call someone who likes that sort of thing uh, evil, but, I, you know, I would call them perverted. And I think that's a term of moral condemnation, perversion. Well, I think you're a prude. I mean, one person's perversion is another person's supreme erotic pleasure. Some people can't handle explicit sexual representations. Some people can't handle explicit violence. That's why the movies have a rating system. So just to keep pornography out of the hands of people who can't handle it, we need a rating system. But otherwise, leave it alone. And you're, I don't know, you're a liberal. Well, but, you know, <laughs> you, there's true, there's a lot to talk about here. And to help us sort through this thicket of issues, we'll be joined in a bit by Ray Langton. She's the author of Sexual Solipsism, Philosophical Essays on Pornography and Objectification. And we'd like our listeners to join in the discussion. The number to call is 1-800-525-9917. That's 1-800-525-9917. But first, our roving philosophical reporter, Molly Samuel, visits a place where pornography is hardly a dirty word. San Francisco's old armory is a three- or four-story brick behemoth on an otherwise normal corner in the Mission District. The National Guard was stationed at the armory until the 1970s, but it's a little different now. So this is the bondage storage room. Wall of whips and chains and leather straps and paddles and uh, stocks and all kinds of crazy things. John Sander is the vice president of marketing at kink.com. The company produces hardcore pornography for its more than 20 fetish websites, sites like Water Bondage and Naked Combat. Before Kink moved into the old armory, they spent a lot of money creating sets that looked how this building looks already. Now they can exploit the armory's creepy, dank, abandoned feel. Yeah, this is a stockade where they actually used to keep the bad soldiers. And it's obviously great for what we do today. Sander says he's proud of what he does. I actually turned the, the job down a couple times. I uh, wasn't ready to have that on my resume. but. At the end of the day, it's, uh, it's a great company. I respect the company. It's a very ethical company. It's a busy place, kink.com. About 100 people are on staff, not including actors who are all independent contractors. Prop designers and set builders bustle around the building, while video editors and web developers sit in dimmed rooms in front of rows of computer monitors. It, uh, it's an interesting place, but it's definitely not the flesh fest that I think a lot of people think about when they think about working in for a porn company. Technology director Stacia Carr keeps the building and the computers running. Particularly working in technology, it's a lot of problem solving that you would do in any other job. The scale of it is sometimes a lot larger, but beyond that, it's just a lot of work. The employees at Kink shoot and produce about five new videos a day. And marketing director John Sanders says they get a lot of web traffic. Just how much? A lot. I mean, millions and millions of people look at our, uh, our content every month. Like most adult entertainment companies, Kink.com is privately owned, so their profits aren't public information. In this industry, those numbers are murky across the board. And in consumer surveys, people aren't always totally honest about how much time or money they spend on pornography. An estimate of about $10 billion in profits for the entire industry has been tossed around. That's including websites, video rentals, and strip clubs. One thing Sander will say, though, is that the business has changed. Probably a lot of the mystique around the adult industry is in the past. Uh, it used to be uh, the wild, wild west on the internet. It's just not the case anymore. There's a lot of competition, and there's a lot of free content that you're competing with, similar to the situation with newspapers. Still, there are some things that will probably never change. Tech director Stacia Carr. In terms of job experiences, uh, getting started here is probably one of the most unique uh, experiences you'll ever have because while it is not particularly exciting once you've been here for a while, uh, you do run into naked models in the middle of the building walking from you know the kitchen back to your office. Um, this does not happen <laughs> in your regular corporate or even technology culture. For Philosophy Talk, I'm Molly Samuel.